Chapter 8, odd number problems, number 9 through 15. Number 9, a random sample is selected from a normal population with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation equal to 20. After a treatment is administered to the individuals in the sample, the sample mean is found to equal 96. How large a sample is necessary for this sample mean to be statistically significant? Assume a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. So the things that we need to break down given um, the parameters provided are as follows. Um, first, what is the effect size? Again, effect size is determined by the difference between m minus mu. So here we have 96 minus 100 which gives us negative four points. So when we talk about effect size, again, it's the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. That's going to help us determine what critical value is necessary. So let's talk about the critical value. Given that we're told to conduct a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05, again, this should, value should become quite familiar to us. Our critical, critical, Z is equal to positive negative, whoops, 1.96. Okay, so positive negative 1.96. And again, what we're trying to determine is what N needs to equal in order for us to push our sample mean of 96 out into the critical region. In other words, a value um, greater than, a Z value greater than 1.96. And um, at this point, we should recognize that since the mean difference or effect size is negative, that the z value we're going to use is the negative version of that critical z, so negative 1.96. Again, the reason I'm doing that is simply because of this negative um, effect size, negative four points, the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is, again, given that we're trying to determine how large of a sample we need, what we ultimately need to know is how large of a z-score do we need to be pushed out into the critical region. So let's start with our z equation. z is equal to m minus mu divided by standard error. I'm just going to replace variables using what I have. So I'm stating that the z um, is going to equal 1.96 negative. Again, that's the minimum requirement. Um, obviously, given our knowledge of the relationship between sample size and standard error, we recognize that whatever we solve um, in this case, we're going to have to increase n to push it out beyond that value of 1.96. I'll draw a graph in just a second to, to help us better understand that. All right, so then we can use, um, replace the variables and say 96 minus 100 divided by the standard error. And so then what we can then um, see is that what we're saying is a, a z value of negative 1.96 is equal to negative 4 over the standard error of the mean. This then um, tells us that what we're missing is the standard error. So we're going to rewrite that and um, say that the standard error is equal to negative 4 over negative 1.96. Again, I just moved the variables around so that I solve for the missing value, in this case, the standard error of the mean. So if we do that calculation, negative 4 divided by negative 1.96, we get 2.04. So again, check your calculators. Don't just um, accept the values that I've presented. So if we round two digits right at the decimal, our final answer of 2.04. Now what we want to do is find out what is the size of n needed to generate this standard error. So I'm going to use my standard error equation. And then, this is something similar to what we did in the last chapter, replace variables. So again, I'm going to use this as the value of my standard error, 2.04 is equal to the standard deviation of the population, which was a given, equal to 20, 
over the square root of, not, of, of n. Again, this is the ultimate goal. What is the value of n that's going to produce a z value that pushes our sample mean out into the critical region? So similar to what we've done in the past, um, we would rewrite this. The square root of n is equal to 20 over the over 2.04. And we're going to get a decimal, and our calculator displays may be slightly different, but let's round three digits right at the decimal and hold off until um, we get our final answer to round and report what sample size needs to equal. So if we do this calculation, 20 divided by 2.04, we should get 9.804. And therefore, if we want to solve for n, we would take 9.804 and square it. And then we would recognize that n equal to 9 would equal 96.12. At this point, we can round two digits right at the decimal, which is a, a standard. Okay, so what we've done is, uh, given the original parameters, um, identifying that we're conducting a two-tailed test, that sets the critical region at positive negative 1.96. Because we're talking about a sample mean that's less than the population mean, we use the z-value of negative 1.96 to determine what our standard error would equal. What our standard error would equal. Once we had that, we could figure out what n must equal. Uh, as, in other words, a sample size of 96.12 will generate a standard error equal to 2.04 and a res as a result equal a z-value negative to 1.96. But we don't want our z-value to equal 1.96, we want it to be greater than 1.96. And therefore we can conclude that n right, would need to be greater than 96.12 to produce a z-value that falls in the critical region. And I'm just going to um, illustrate that. Let's say that n is equal to 97, right, greater than 96.12. If that's true, um, then again, our standard error of the mean would equal, standard error of the mean would equal 20 over the square root of 97. And that gives us something close to 2.03. Notice the effect. I increased n, and my standard error decreased. And then my z value would equal 96 minus 100 divided by 2.03. And that gives me a z score of negative 1.97. I'm going to draw as small as I can here to fit this in. Again, we were talking about finding a z score that pushed us into the critical region, and we would conclude that this value does fall in the critical region, um, and that enables us to reject the null hypothesis. This last part is not necessary, but it is recommended so that you can check your answers, so that, again, you affirm the relationship between n and the standard error of the mean. Okay, number 9b, similar to what we just did. You know, we're given some parameters, but now we're working with the sample mean equal to 96. So the effect size would be understood as the mean minus mu, or in this case, 96 minus 100 is equal to 2 points. 2 points is the effect size. So given that and the parameter set where we're con conducted two-tailed test, we know that our z, our critical z, and let me just be more specific and write critical z, is equal to positive negative 1.96. Okay, and then, um, again, that's based on alpha equal to 0 0.05 and two-tailed test. We are going to figure out what n must equal to generate a z value that falls into the critical region. And again, because the mean difference, um, again, the difference is 2, and I should be more careful here, it's negative 2-point difference. Therefore, the z-value, critical z-value we're going to focus on is the negative version, just as we did in the last example. Now, if we were talking about a positive mean difference, we would use the positive critical z-value of 1.96. Um, so you have to be conscientious of 
the effect size that you're working with. So as we did in the last example, z is equal to m minus mu divided by the standard error. We replace variables, so at minimum we want a z value equal to 1.96 at the critical region. Then again, we'll know what to do with n to push it out into the critical region. And we replace variables here, 98 minus 100, divided by our standard error. And we would then simplify that and say a z of one point, negative 1.96 is equal to negative 2 over our standard error. And now we're going to solve for the standard error given a z value of negative 1.96. So that's equal to our value of negative 2 over negative 1.96. Again, that's not the equation for standard error. Just recognize that what I'm doing is rewriting these variables to solve for the missing variable of standard error. And that gives us negative 2 divided by negative 1.96 gives us 1.02. Okay, so now we're going to use our standard error equation replace variables so that we can solve for n. So we're saying the standard error equal to 1.02, right, generates a z-score of negative 1.96. So we replace variables. This becomes 20 over the square root of n. Square root of n, therefore, is equal to 20 over 1.02. If we do the calculation, the square root of n is equal to 19.608. Again, that was just by taking 20 divided by 1.02. And therefore, n would be equal to 19.608 squared. And we find that n would be equal to 384.47. We can round two digits, write a decimal for our final answer. Again, emphasizing the relationship between sample size, standard error, and z. Again, just to review, as n increases, standard error decreases, and z value increases. As a result, we would conclude that n must be greater than 384.47, right? Again, n represents the number of individuals, so we, it would be more accurate to round to the nearest whole number. I didn't do that on the last one and, um, just because I neglected to make that point, but we're essentially saying n must be greater than 385 because n represents the number of individuals, and we're not going to have a, a fraction of a sample size. So. Technically speaking, we would say that n must be greater than 385 to produce a z-score that falls into the critical region. Again, our z-score um, critical region identified as negative 1.96, and we would have to generate a value, a z-value greater than that, greater than that in the sense that it would be greater than 1.96, meaning 1.97, 1.98, Again, no, noting that the negative sign just tells us what side of the mean we are on. Number 11, the research site in the previous problem also examined the effect of caffeine on response time in the driving simulator. In a similar study, researchers measured reaction time 30 minutes after participants consumed one six ounce cup of coffee. Using the same driving simulation task, for which the distribution of reaction times is normal with the mean equal to 400 milliseconds and standard deviation equal to 40. They obtained a mean of m equal to 392 for a sample size of 36 participants. Are the data sufficient to conclude that caffeine has a significant effect on reaction time? Use two-tailed tests with alpha equal to 0.05. What I've done here, and even though it was not asked, I stated the null hypothesis, which reads caffeine has no effect on reaction time. The notation that would go along with that would indicate that mu, and mu represents the untreated, um, excuse me, the treated population. So the treated population would equal 400 milliseconds, no different from the untreated population. 
So caffeine, the, for the research hypothesis, caffeine has an effect on reaction time. And sorry for the uh, typo there, reaction. Time. So mu for the treated population would not equal 400 milliseconds. Okay, so um, illustrating a difference um, between the sample and the population mean. So in order to proceed, um, again, given the, the steps presented on how to conduct a hypothesis test, the first step is to identify the research and null hypothesis. We've done that. The next step is to set the parameters. So that means identify the critical Z value. And in this case, because we're conducting a two-tail test at alpha equal to 0 0.05, we know that very familiar Z value of 1.96. And again, what we are doing is setting up the test. Again, the average reaction time is equal to 400 for the untreated population. In other words, those who do not take the caffeine. And our sample mean, our sample mean is equal to 392. That's going to be to the left, but before we do anything with that, we want to identify the critical region, negative 1.96, positive 1.96. Again, this shaded area defines the critical region. If we get a Z value beyond that critical region Z value, we get to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we're going to calculate our Z score. To do so, we're going to need our standard error. Standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. Standard deviation in this case is equal to 40. And n is equal to 36. So we get 40 divided by 6. And our standard error is equal to, so if you take 40 divided by 6, we get 6.67. Now we can calculate our z value. z is equal to 392 minus 400 over 6.67. And if we do our calculation, 392 minus 400 net calculators divided by 6.67, we get a z-score equal to, if we round, negative 1.20. 1.20. And now at this point, we can look to see where that Z value resides. Um, so we know that it's not large enough, right, to be pushed out into the critical region. It would fall between a Z score of negative 1.96 and a Z score of zero, which is the same as the mean in the center of the distribution. So what we're going to do next is calculate a co the Cohen's D statistic to help um, support this visual conclusion. At this point, we know we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. Again, the null says um, that they're equal. The sample mean and the population mean are equal. And we fail to reject that idea because the sample mean z-score was not large enough to be placed in the critical region. All right, so um, for that example, we're going to compute Cohen's D. Again, Cohen's D is a statistic, a supporting statistic, to help us determine if we have accurately drawn appropriate conclusions. So it's the mean difference divided by the standard deviation of the population. Notice the difference. Z is equal to mean difference divided by standard error. D is... Um, equal to the mean difference divided by standard deviation of the population. So in other words, D is representing the distance between the sample mean and the population mean expressed in standard deviation units. Let me just put that. So D is equal to um, the distance between M and mu expressed in standard deviation units. 
And again, the reason that we've come up with this, with, um, why Cohen came up with this statistic is to minimize the effects of increasing N. We've just done some examples that if we increase sample size, we know that has an effect on standard error and as a result um, impacts the Z value. So lower, uh, larger N increases standard, um, excuse me, larger N decreases standard error, standard error decreased then increases our Z value. So this helps to prevent us from drawing conclusions based on an, a large N and uh, focus on the effect size because that's what we're interested in is the difference between sample mean and the population mean. So let's do our calculation. D is equal to 392 minus 400 divided by 40. So in our calculators, 392 minus 400 divided by 40, and we get negative 0 0.20. And just a, a point of clarification, Mathematically, this is the correct value, but when we report Cohen's D in our final um, research findings, we do not report it as a negative. So again, because what Cohen's D demonstrates is the standard deviation, so we would not express that as a negative. So we're just saying that the mean difference, mean difference is equal to 0.2 standard deviation units. Again, um, we have a table to reference to determine um, the size of effect. And in this case, 0.2 is considered a very small effect. What we are um, seeing is that the distance or the difference between the sample mean and the population mean is expressed by 0.2, a fraction of a standard deviation unit. So again, we know that one standard deviation unit frames the common region. And so this isn't outside of that. And therefore, we conclude that the mean difference is too small for us to reject the null hypothesis. All right, the last thing we need to do is um, draw our concluding statement. And um, based on our hypothesis, our null hypothesis is always about the test of the null. So we've concluded that we fail to reject the null. And we would conclude that that means in, um, in this context is that the caffeine does not have an effect on reaction time. And we would cite our statistics. So Z was equal to negative 1.20, comma, our probability statement. The probability of obtaining the sample mean equal to 392 is greater greater than a 5% chance. And our supporting statistic would indicate D is equal to 2.0. Again, just to report the positive value or Cohen's D, even though mathematically it equals a negative value. So again, we reject the fit, um, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Caffeine does not have an effect on reaction time. Our Z was equal to negative 1.2. The probability of obtaining um, a sample mean of 392 is greater than our alpha 5% and D is equal to 2.0. One more thing to emphasize Cohen's D, again, if we have our distribution with a mean of 400, a, score, uh, a sample mean equal to 392, sample mean here. What we're saying is that given Cohen's D, this sample mean of 392 is 0.20 standard deviation units below the mean. Very close, so that I didn't draw it as, um, as 
accurately as I could have. Again, just showing that this distance is only 0.2 standard deviation units. When we talk about standard error units, it was 1.2 standard error units, but this is back in its original unit, so we have a, a better sense of the distance between these two, and that's not a very significant distance, so the mean difference, which is our emphasis, is not large. One final note, um, because the Cohen's D uh, corresponds to our conclusion, we feel confident that we have not engaged in a type 2 error. Um, type 2 error says that we would uh, fail to reject the null when the null is actually false. In other words, if our um, z value of negative 1.20 warrants that we fail to reject, um, and let's say our d, again, this is just a, a hypothetical, if d was equal to 1, right, um, the standards say that a Cohen's d greater than 0 0.8 um, illustrates um, high effect, high or strong mean difference. So if they didn't match, in other words, if our z value fell in the common region, but our Cohen's d was quite high, then there's reason to believe that the um, conclusion of failing re to reject the null may not be the accurate um, conclusion, and we may have engaged in a type 2 error. Again, this isn't asked in this particular problem, but I thought it was um, um, necessary to apply that concept. Number 13, researchers at a national weather center in the northeast um, of the United States recorded the number of 90 degree days each year since records first started in 1875. The numbers form a normal shape distribution with a mean equal to 9.6 and a standard deviation equal to 1.9. To see if the data showed any evidence of global warming, they also computed the mean number of 90 days for the most recent sample of four years and obtained an average of 11.85. Do the data indicate that the past four years have had significantly more 90 degree days than would be expected for a random sample from the population? So they're trying to determine that um, if we consider recent history or um, in the past four years, do, does the, the average um, temperature seem to be increasing significantly? So I wrote the null in the research. Um, past, the null states that the past four years have equal to or less uh, 90 degree days than would be expected. And again, that the way that it's phrased is due to the fact that we were told use a one tail test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. So I have to identify the direction and um, Again, they're saying that we would um, express, expect less um, 90 degree days, and um, the research would say the past four years have more 90 degree days than would be expected. And again, the no notation for the null says the um, global warming um, population has less or equal to 9.6 average um, number of days for degrees over 90, 90, and then the population would be greater than 9.6. In other words, we have more than an average of 9.6 days measuring greater than 90 degrees. Not sure if um, the time was cut off there. I apologize if there was a technical glitch, um, but there is a notation. So we're going to identify our critical z value. Z value is equal to positive 1.65 because again we are expecting um, more. The word more identifies which side of the tail um, or which tail and which side of the mean we're interested in finding our results. Um, and again, the 1.65 comes from taking that 0 0.05 and using the tail. Again, we would take 0 0.0500, use the unit normal table to report the z value. So the corresponding z value is 1.65. All right, um, next, our standard error of the mean is equal to 1.96 divided by the square root of 4, or n. 
and we get 0.95. And our z value is equal to um, equation mean of sample minus mean of population over the standard error. Excuse me, standard error. So our z would equal, replace variables, 11.85 minus 9.6. Notice that the mean effect um, or mean difference is in the direction that we hypothesize, so that's a good thing. And we would conclude that our z is equal to 2.37 mathematically um, given this equation. So again, our parameters state that the average number of 90 degree days um, in, given the history is 9.6 and um, per year. And what we've established that um, our Z value that determines the critical region is 1.65 and we're hoping our Z value falls in this area here. And given this value, we say that it does. Um, 2.37 is beyond 1.65, so we know at this point we're gonna be able to reject the null and now um, what we're going to do is a couple more steps, which includes Cohen's D and then write our concluding statement. Okay, so our Cohen's D is going to help support these conclu this conclusion um, that we would reject the null hypothesis and um, provide support that the last four years do demonstrate that we have a significant increase in the number of 90 degree days in the year. So Cohen's D is the effect size divided by standard deviation. So D is equal to 1 point, um, excuse me, 11.85 minus 9.6 divided by 1.9 and we get 1.18 and again, referring back to our table, anything above 0.8 is considered high. So this is a high effect size. And what that does for us is confirm our conclusions that yes, we got a z-score that was large enough to be pushed out into the tail. And this supporting statistic um, is helping us feel confident in that conclusion. So again, we would write that we reject and I'm so sorry, this is going to be a little bit sloppy because it's so small. Reject the null. We reject the idea that um, the past four days, a sample of past four years, excuse me, um, illustrates the same average number of 90 degree days per year. We reject that idea and we would conclude um, that Z is equal to 2.37. The probability of obtaining a sample average of 11.85 for the average number of 90 degree days per year, the probability of that is less than our alpha, 0 0.05. And we'll learn, and even though this, it's not yet presented, um, that we conducted a one-tail test. This will come later, but it's a little preview to, to what we'll see in the next um, chapters. And then we'd follow with our supporting statistic of D is equal to 1.18. So the probability statement, if we're just going to focus on one thing, when it says less than alpha, we know that the sample mean produces the value in the critical region. Um, and then the D value of 1.18 says that the difference from here, um, from 9.6 to, and I'm just going to write M equal to 11.85, the difference between those two values is equal to 1.18 standard deviation units. So again, showing great mean difference or great effect size. And that's it for this one. Number 15, research has noted a decline in cognitive functioning as people age. However, the results from other research suggest that, suggest that antioxidant in foods such as blueberries can reduce and even reverse these age-related declines. 
at least in laboratory rats. Based on these results, one might theorize that the same antioxidants might also benefit elderly humans. Suppose a researcher is interested in testing this theory. The researcher obtains a sample of 16 adults who are older than 65 and gives each participant a daily dose of a blueberry supplement that is very high in antioxidants. After taking the supplement for six months, the participants are given a standardized cognitive test and produce a mean score equal to 50.2. For the general population of elderly adults, scores on the test average 45 and form a normal distribution with a standard deviation equal to 9. Can the researcher conclude that the supplement has a significant effect on the cognitive skills? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. So here we have our research and our null hypothesis with the notation. Again, it's a two-tailed test. You're not going to see the um, directional differences. We're just going to say the null indicates that those who take the supplement, their cognitive skill score average would equal 45, same as the population. And the research is going to say that they will not, it will not equal 45. All right, to conduct our test, we're going to need to identify the critical region. And again, a Z would equal positive negative 1.96. So we'll draw this out. The average cognitive skills score is 45. And we're going to find, hopefully find a Z value greater than 1.96 or 1.96 negative. So again, we hope to fall in the critical region. We're going to calculate our Z score. And first, we need our standard error. So standard error is equal to the standard deviation of 9 over the square root of we have um, 16 individuals, so 9 divided by 4, and we get a standard error equal to 2.25. Our z value is equal to m minus mu, or standard error. z is equal to our sample average was 50.2 minus the population average of 45. We see a difference. Again, our job is to determine if that difference is due to sampling error or also known as chance, or due to the treatment, the supplement. So we enter 50.2 minus 45, and we get 2.25, and that's equal to 2.31, and that's our z-score. And again, we, we look to see where that falls, and it's greater than 1.96. So at this point, we know we're going to reject the null. I'm going to do a couple more steps we, before we write our final concluding statement. Okay, so we're going to calculate our Cohen's d for that example. So d is equal to sample mean minus mu divided by standard deviation. Again, what we want to identify is the mean difference expressed in standard deviation units to give us a better sense of how different the sample, the sample mean is compared to the population mean. So we get 50.2 minus 45 divided by 9, and we get a Cohen's d of 0.58, which, given our table, is considered a medium effect. Medium effect. Okay, but not small. So we would continue with our understanding that, um, again, what we've just concluded, that the difference between the population mean of 45 and um, a sample mean of 50.2. The difference from here to here is 0.58 standard deviation units. Again, medium, right? We know that within one standard deviation unit, those are common scores. So this is it halfway, um, a little more closer to one. Um, so that's where the medium effect is coming from. But nonetheless, um, it, it's not low, so we're going to use it as a supporting statistic to draw our conclusion. So in this case, we get to reject the null. I'm going to write a little bit more than I did in the last one because I have more room. Um, the supplement. had a significant effect. Again, if you're saying that you reject the null, that's the same as saying significant effect on cognitive skills.
and then our supporting statistic z was equal to 2.31. The probability of obtaining that um, sample average of 50.2 from an untreated population, again, it's always about the probability of obtaining that sample mean from the untreated population. The probability of obtaining such a high cognitive skill score is less than our alpha 0.05 and D is equal to 0.58. Again, this, this notation makes us happy, right? We want to see the probability less than our alpha because that means we rejected the null. So again, I'm just going to write a little more text to help us better understand that. Again, what we're saying is the probability of obtaining a sample mean equal to 50.2 on the cognitive skills test, um, 50.2 from the untreated population is less than 5%. Okay, again, we want things that have small probability to conclude that we see significant differences between the sample mean and the population mean. So again, that probability statement, it's always about the sample mean in relation to um, the untreated population. I hope this sentence helps you better understand that very important notation.